Hi, I'm Will. And I'm Tracy. And for this lecture, we are going to be going into some detail into this uh, form. This is the JA Casey's Observational Gate Analysis Form. So for this lecture, go ahead and print off the form so you can follow along as Will takes you through um, some detailed uh, descriptions of the different things on this form. So the JAKC Observational Gate Analysis Form comes from this book here, Observational Gate Analysis, A Visual Guide. And if you're wondering what the JAKC stands for, it's literally the author's initials. So <laughs> they were really original on that one. <laughs> so uh, this is really a great um, little tool. And this is probably my favorite gate analysis form that I have seen. Um, one of the things, first of all, it's not bad to look at. We've got a lot of color here, which a lot of the other forms are definitely lacking. Um, but that color has a lot of functionality. Mm -hmm. So for this one, we see like this blue here. If you go to the top, like it says weight acceptance, or the yellow single limb support reds is swing limb advancement. All of these things kind of give you a little bit of clue in about what's happening at that particular point in time. So this is very focused on really the three tasks of gait, and that comes from Jacqueline Perry's gait analysis book. Um, side note, that book is Tracy's coffee table book. She's amazing, guys. She's amazing. She's <laughs> the gait god dis goddess. Sure. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's fantastic. But those three tasks that this form goes into are really, they're the functional part of gait that you really do want to hone in on because that's what probably your patient's complaining about the most. Mm -hmm. So the other thing about this is that it is a simple checkbox format. So it's super easy to go through, it's easy to read through, um, and so it just has a lot of clinical utility as well as being a great training tool. So let's go into this a little bit further. <clears throat> so here we're looking at the, at the top or kind of the header of this form. So here we see that we've got the different illustrations of all of the different phases here. And again, these are the eight phases as defined by Ranchos Los Amigos. So this is initial contact, loading response, Mid stance, terminal stance, pre swing, initial swing, mid swing, and terminal swing. So, one of the things I really love about this, particularly when you get into the, the three tasks of gait, is for example, often when you look at when people think about stance versus swing, they think of pre swing as being part of stance still. Right. But the way that this form organizes it is actually pre swing is a part of swing limb advancement. So, again, this, this form is really starting to kind of cue you into more of the functional aspects of what you should be looking at. Um, so, let's, uh, we're going to dive in now into the ankle. All right, so as we get here to the ankle and as we go through the different joints, um, we're not going to be covering all of the different things, but kind of the big ones that we think usually have tend to have the most misconception or I think are the things that you, you need to be able to see. So um, as we go through these, the ones that we're going to highlight, we're also going to have short little video clips as we talk through these two. Um, so let's go ahead and get into here. So when we look at the ankle, ankle in initial contact, there's three main ways that we can get that initial contact to occur. Um, one is a forefoot contact. So this is where as the foot hits the ground, the toes are actually the first thing to make contact with the ground. Uh, a flat foot contact, which is where the toes and the heel actually hit at the same exact time. So the whole flat part of the foot hits the ground um, uniformly. And then finally is abbreviated heel contact. So this is where the heel is the first thing to make contact with the floor. But traditionally, this is also kind of paired with the one below it, the inadequate dorsiflexion. So the toes actually aren't very high off of the ground. So it's very, basically the toes are almost immediately on the ground after the heel makes contact. Now jumping over to loading response, we have foot slap was an extremely common thing to see. And here. True. And Sorry. here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is probably one of the most audible things of all of this here. Um, so foot slap is extremely common. It's one of those things that you're definitely going to be able to hear mm -hmm. and, and see. Um, and then also in that same exact phase is you could potentially see inadequate dorsiflexion as well. And we'll show a clip of that. So getting now to the single limb support task, uh, the biggest thing here that we like to note is excessive dorsiflexion. So this is kind of common. It happens with a couple other things that we'll be seeing in here as well. And as we go now into swing limb advancement, uh, the big one here that we like to talk about is the contralateral vault. Mm -hmm. So contralateral vault is kind of a weird one to observe in here. Um, but basically what happens is the contralateral side, so not the side that you're actually looking at, but the side opposite of that, 
actually goes into plantar flexion and kind of the person rises up on their toes and they raise their whole body up into the air. And what that does, it allows our reference limb, the one that we're looking at, to actually clear the ground. So for example, if they have inadequate dorsiflexion, like the one, the one that's above it, and they're not clearing the ground very well, occasionally they may actually go up on the toes of the other side or perform a contralateral ball in order to clear the foot. So the, the, the deviation is then uh, the, the, the decrease in dorsiflexion, but you're seeing that on the other side with the contralateral vault. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So now as we go into the calcaneus and the toes, um, here obviously we've got the excess inversion and eversion that can happen really throughout the whole entire cycle. Um, inversions really only seen uh, alone is, is seen in the swing phase. Um, the biggest place that we do see that though is for the inversion or eversion is mostly in single limb support where you've actually placed the weight of the body. Um, this is where you're going to note it and really has the most clinical significance as well. Um, other things obviously like this is, these would be things for the toes that you would have to have their shoe off. So if you don't have the shoe off, which occasionally is okay, then you know, you're not going to capture these things. The, probably the biggest one, and probably, again, another one, one with significant clinical importance, is the, what's it called, the inadequate MTPX, which is inadequate metaphalangeal extension. Um, so this is basically where an individual gets to that terminal stance and really almost a pre-swing, and basically their limb is behind them. They've placed all of the weight into the ball of the foot right around those met heads, and the, uh, basically the tarsals are now going into a little bit of extension. The toes are extending. Um, that's a very, very important part uh, of the gait cycle. It really starts to kind of wind up the tension both in the, the quad, or sorry, in the uh, calf muscle mm -hmm. to kind of help to guide that foot forward um, in the swing limit. Yeah, it's like the cock of the gun. It's like everything is ready to go, um, but if they don't have that toe extension, it's not going to go as fast and as far as you want it to go. So definitely a big thing to be looking out for. Next, we're going to dive into the knee. So obviously inadequate in extension and flexion, as long as you know your normal gait pattern, those things are going to be extremely clear for you to be able to see. The big ones that we're going to cover are really in that second column when you get into single limb support. Um, and what we see here, and really a miscon misconception happens between hyperextension mm -hmm. and extensor thrust. The best way that we like to describe this is hyperextension really just refers to the position that the knee happens to be in. So for example, if they put their leg out and their leg just assumes a position of hyperextension right from the get-go, then that would be called hyperextension, which is basically a genu record bottom. Mm -hmm. So an extensor thrust is where there's actually a movement into that hyperextension, or really, I mean, it doesn't even have to be hyperextension. Um, and so what we would see there is you might see a slightly flexed knee or a straight, or straight knee that then has a forcible movement into that extension, extension position or hyperextension position. So hyperextension is really just a static held position of hyperextension. And extensor thrust is a forceful movement into that extension. So, Will, if somebody had extensor thrust, would I mark extensor thrust and the hyperextension on the form? Absolutely, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be wrong. Mm. So, then we get into this, and probably my favorite one on this is the wobble. And <laughs> <laughs> a hilarious name for a deviation. But wobble is basically is looking at... Um, instability within the knee joint. So for an individual here, they're going to basically be going into flexion, extension of the knee and kind of an alternating pattern. So it's really a sign that that knee doesn't have great control overall. Or proprioception, awareness of where that joint is in space and you see it kind of trying to figure out where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And then finally in that last one is um, the thrust and then on either side of it you see a varus or a valgus thrust. Usually you would select two of these, two of these boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so like Obviously, we, we've, you're aware with varus and valgus positioning of the knee, and so if they do have that position of the knee, you could just select those individually. But if they happen to have a thrust or a forceful movement into that position, then you would select, for example, like varus and thrust at the same time. And this is sort of similar to what we were talking about with the hyperextension and the extensor thrust. So somebody could have a varus deformity just by itself, or they could have a varus thrust that's occurring. So as now we get into the, the swing phase, um, big things that we can see um, are things, uh, again, inadequate flexion or extension, but we can also see an extensor thrust at that point in time. 
or even an excess contralateral flexion that can occur here as well. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we dive into the thigh here. And so the thigh is a really crucial one to get because looking at the thigh gives you a picture of what's actually happening up in the hip joint. Mm -hmm. So important for your patient to have shorts or for their pant legs to be rolled up so you can see that thigh. Um, so obviously here we've got flexion and extension, and if you've got a good understanding of your, your gait mechanics, then those things are going to pop out really easily to you. Also things like circumduction, really common thing to be able to, be able to see, um, in addition to abduction and adduction. The big one that we want to talk about here is both medial rotation and lateral type rotation, particularly when it comes to stance phase. So when you're looking at an individual's lower extremity, and let's say for medial rotation, Sometimes you might have an individual who has a valgus deformity at their knee or what appears to be one, but sometimes if you get a good picture of what's happening in the thigh and eventually up to the hip, they may actually be presenting with a really significant medial rotation that's actually causing issues further down. So it's important that when you're doing analysis like this that you capture things like that so you get a good overall picture with what's happening at the patient and that you're not just assuming that something further down in the body is independent of anything else that's happening. Um, you can also see that in like a lateral rotation as well. So here they may be having like a toed out kind of position or a, a wide base of support. And if you didn't look at the thigh or kind of up into what's happening at the hip joint, you might miss that they may actually have an external rotation position of their hips, either from tightness or some other pathology. Which will change your interventions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Next up is the pelvis. So the pelvis is really a key point when you're talking, especially about the efficiency of somebody's gait pattern, and it can be also a really difficult place to get a good observation of what's happening. Um, for example, a lot of people um, have like long shirts that might go down past the pelvis, so this might be a good opportunity to see if they can help to pull up that shirt or maybe roll it even into like, like the top of their shorts or the top of their pants so that you can kind of get a good picture of what is happening in the pelvis. Um, big things that we like to talk about here, one is in the, in the, the single limb support, is an excess anterior tilt. So this is common in patients who might have um, gluteus maximus weakness, um, or occasionally even like weak abdominal muscles mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then other big ones that you see in this, the same one, are either inadequate backward rotation or excessive backward rotation. So inadequate, you know, let's say you have somebody who has very stiff back, very stiff pelvis and hips, you may not actually get a whole lot of rotation going through there. And that's actually causing a lot of loss of efficiency at that time. Whereas excessive uh, backward rotation, you might see this more in like a neurological population, such as an individual who had a stroke, but has a lot of difficulty in kind of moving that pelvis in the rotational sense. Now, as we go into the swing limb advancement, um, there's obviously a couple things in here, the different hip drops that can occur, the Trendelenburg style of patterns that you might see within the hips. Um, but other ones that we're looking at here is really looking at the forward rotation. The most notable one being an inadequate forward rotation. So when somebody's taking a forward step, there should also be a forward pelvic rotation that goes along with that. That's gonna allow the person to get a nice step length and again, to get a lot of efficiency out of their walking cycle. So that's another big thing that we're looking for is are they actually getting like that five degrees? And it's not much, only five degrees of uh, forward rotation um, within the pelvis. Yeah, kind of rather than walking like a tin soldier where just the legs are moving, there should be a little bit of movement that's happening um, at the pelvis as well. And finally on the form, we get to the trunk. Now we're not gonna go through much of this, but basically these, are, these really stick out pretty strongly. So this is either a forward lane, a backward lane, a left or a right. So here you're just making sure to note it in whichever phase or whichever task it happens to be presenting itself. Now overall with this form, the biggest thing that you wanna do is to make sure to practice over and over and over again. The best way to get gain analysis um, as, as a strong skill of yours and to really develop what we would say like your clinical eye is to practice. So use this form, use some case studies, uh, you know, continuously try it with different patients. Again, the more experience that you have with it, the better you're gonna be with it, and even the better that you'll be without it as well. So next thing that we're gonna be doing is actually reviewing a case study. So the next video you'll see in this series is a case study video where you'll actually perform this. 
So again, if you haven't printed this off yet, again, the link for this is in the description below. So go ahead and print that off. In our next video, you'll be watching the video and actually performing the analysis with, along with it. Um, big things here is make sure you didn't mark anything that you didn't see. If you missed something, that's okay. But you also don't want to be making stuff up uh, because you want to have a good clinical picture. There's always a next time for doing a gain analysis mm -hmm. as well. So you know, just because you didn't get it that first time doesn't mean that you've missed the whole boat. You know, there's always another opportunity to get more gain analysis the next time you see a patient. Definitely. So um, big things also as you're going through the case study for yourself, um, we certainly encourage you to play the video multiple times. There will also be a slow motion feature in there as well, so you'll be able to kind of get a really nice long look at what's happening with the patient. It might be our uh, little cue as to why we firmly believe in videoing your patients during their gait analysis because yes. it makes it so much easier to review uh, num numerous times in order to use this form to the best of your ability. Absolutely, and it's a great way to start off practicing. Definitely.